as you see, we are going to be talking about uh, ADHD, fighting it rather than your child. And these are the things that we're hoping to cover this evening. Um, myths about ADHD, what is ADHD, the diagnostic criteria for it, the executive functions and how they may affect your child, parenting your ADHD child, teaching an ADHD student, myths about the stimulants and how do stimulant medications work, the side effects of certain medications, deciding whether you want your child to be on medication, and uh, information about non-stimulant medications. So we're gonna start off with our myths. And the first myth that we often hear is that children with ADHD won't amount to anything. What we do find, uh, children with ADHD learn differently, but it does not mean that they are incapable of success. There's an extensive list of authors, scientists, actors, singers, composers, and athletes who have been diagnosed with ADD or, D or ADHD. ADHD has nothing to do with intelligence uh, or ability to be successful. Uh, we have Walt Disney, we have John Kennedy, Michael Jordan, and Justin Timberlake to name another few people who have ADD, and that um, it certainly didn't stop these people from being successful. The truth is, when people who have ADHD find something that they feel passionate about, they will uh, dedicate themselves harder than anyone, oftentimes crushing the competition. Myth number two, ADHD is caused by bad parenting. All the child needs is discipline. ADHD is not caused by bad parenting, but parenting techniques can improve some symptoms and make others worse. Myth number three is ADHD is a life sentence. Although ADHD symptoms usually continue into adulthood, the person learns ways to cope with the symptoms. People with ADHD have plenty of energy, are creative, and can often accomplish more than people who do not have the condition. Myth four, medication for ADHD will make the person seem drugged. Properly adjusted medication for ADHD sharpens a person's focus and increases his or her ability to control behavior and emotions. Myth five is that children outgrow ADHD. About 70% of children with ADHD continue to have symptoms during their teen years, and about 50% have symptoms into adulthood. So what is ADHD? It is a genetic disorder associated with deficits in the functioning of certain brain regions connected to inhibition, attention, and self-control. So it will affect and um, look as a person will have short attention span, impulsivity, and hyperactivity. So it's a little bit of information about the short attention span. Um, you might see this person having a tendency to quickly become bored with repetitive tasks. Um, he or she may have a tendency to shift from one activity to another without finishing the first activity. The person may have a tendency to lose focus or concentration during a multi-step task, or multi-steps or task. And the, the person may have a tendency to be nagged by other people. The reason that that is is because of the first three things, um, they do have that tendency to have difficulty shifting, um, then other people are always, uh, Peter, hurry up, or come on, you gotta do this, and therefore the nagging occurs. Okay, number two, we see impulsivity. A tendency to be easily distracted. Um, you may tend, and this is, this is wrong, <laughs> it's that the child may have a tendency to leap before he looks. We did it the wrong way. A tendency to, and we did this, we tried to correct things for five or six times, but anyway. A tendency to interrupt other people. A tendency to blurt out answers and comments before questions and statements are completed. The child may have difficulty taking turns 
or even waiting and standing in line for his turn. Number three is hyperactivity. A tendency to be very busy, lots of activity that's not at all related to the task at hand. This person may struggle to sit still, stand still, and wait in line. <laughs> this person may struggle with occupying his or her own time, and he or she may not know how to relax. So you may wonder um, how a child gets diagnosed and what the doctor is looking for. So just basically, there's um, a little system where in that first column, if there's six or more of these uh, symptoms of inattention, the doctor will probably give a diagnosis of ADHD or six or more symptoms in the second column too, which includes hyperactivity and impulsivity. Now, probably everybody in this room has bits and pieces of you know, so signs and symptoms of ADHD, but that doesn't mean we all have it. We can probably learn from some strategies on how to manage ourselves to be more organized or on time or whatever it is. But, and this is really important, that, that uh, a true diagnosis actually takes six of one column or six in the other column. And I'll just quickly read them out. Um, for inattention, it would be failing to give close attention and makes careless mistakes has trouble paying attention, does not seem to listen when spoken to, does not seem to listen when spoken to directly, hmm. easily distracted by extraneous stimuli, difficulty organizing tasks, fails to follow through, loses things needed for task completion, often forgetful in daily activities, and avoids tasks requiring sustained attention. In the second column of hyperactivity impulsivity, there's things like fidgeting and squirming, leaving her seat, runs or climbs excessively, difficulty playing in leisure activities quietly, and on the go all the time, talking excessively. Or blurting out answers before questions are completed, has difficulty waiting in turn, trouble standing in line, and interrupting uh, or intruding. But my child shows so many more symptoms, or those three symptom types are just the tip of the iceberg. Here's the reason why. The executive functions. What are executive functions of the brain? The brain processes that have to do with managing one's own behavior and emotions in order to achieve one's goal. Brain-based functions involving mental control of our behavior and feelings. And very bright kids can have weak executive skills. It has nothing to do with intelligence. So we tried to put this little um, uh, chart up here helping people to realize how important it is to understand uh, the brain's executive functions. So what we've tried to do is um, uh, pretend that it is the orchestra leader. So all of these eight sections are part of the orchestra leader. And if they don't work properly, no matter how good the, exec the uh, orchestra leader is, the orchestra that he's actually leading is not gonna sound good at all. So these eight things have to work really well. Uh, and oftentimes we find that kids with the ADHD, there may be, and there, and there is, um, deficits in these areas. Okay, so again, and I know you've heard these words quite a bit already, is inhibition, which is the ability to put on the brakes to stop behavior so that we behave appropriately for the circumstances. So we've all seen kids, they know what they should be doing, like being quiet as they walk into the classroom, but darned if they can. They just zoom right through and it's, uh, and that's it. And then they also, um, or may have a difficulties shifting, and that's the ability to move from one activity to the next or even one, one subject to the next in a, in a classroom situation. We have uh, another uh, brain executive function is the working memory 
and that's the ability to hold information short term in order to use it to complete a task. So if the teacher or a parent is saying, okay, at seven o'clock you have to do this, and at 7.10 and 7.30, the child really has difficulty holding those three points in his memory. And that's why they may be shifting all over the place. It's not that they don't want to follow through, it's that they can't. And self-monitoring is the ability to self-regulate emotions or performance in varying situations. The ability to monitor progress throughout a task, and this is important, um, can also involve self-talk. Um, we find that kids who have ADD, ADHD, don't do the self-talk. It's, it's that kind of talk where, yeah, well, this is what I gotta do this morning, and then I'm gonna do this, and then I'm gonna have a good lunch, and they kind of follow through their day, and they can really monitor themselves. Um, I ask the kids, do you do self-talk? And I kind of explain what it is, and they go, no. And so a lot of times, even when parents come in, and I ask them, they'll go, no. Nope. So you, you, it, is a genetic thing uh, a lot of times, but it's so teachable. And when we uh, bring them in and we teach them strategies, they catch on really easily and um, there's, there's a lot of success with that. Emotional self-control uh, is poor frustration tolerance. Uh, it's necessary so that emotions do not take over the ability to function. And Dr. Barkley, he's probably, I consider him the granddaddy of ADHD. Um, he indicates that people with ADHD are actually experiencing ex excessive feelings. They're not overreacting, um, uh, just overfeeling. Then there, another executive function is planning and organizing. The, it's the ability to manage current and future tasks you may say things like, you never told me I had a test tomorrow. Um, weaknesses in working memory and inhibition uh, may interfere with the ability to keep the future in mind. The next one is organizing work and material. It's the ability to be organized in a workspace, at a desk space, and a play space. That's why those desks are such a mess when you open up the lid and yikes, look out. Or their rooms, the 14-year-old girl's bedroom, wow. Okay, so, um, and it's not because they don't want to. They have real difficulty even figuring out what to do next, first and second, that kind of thing. Um, and then the last one is initiating. Uh, it's the child's ability to begin on uh, tasks and activities and being able to um, generate and um, start to solve problems. They just don't have that self-motivation um, until they, you maybe suggest rewards, and we're going to get into that a little bit later on. Okay. So how do weak executive functions affect a child with ADHD? So don't forget, the executive function is the orchestra leader, okay? So he's kind of uh, telling the brain what to do and staying organized and uh, shifting from one thing to another. In ADHD, the executive organizing functions of the brain are doing a poor job of helping the child to plan for the future and to follow through on plans. These skills mature slowly, generally, in kids with ADHD. Generally, kids diagnosed with ADHD tend to be somewhat, oh, sorry, uh, um, yeah, emotionally behind um, and socially behind. The child is likely not lacking knowledge about how to do a task, it's the follow through. Instead, the child needs your help with providing clear instructions, rearranging work, so it's more interesting, providing motivation to complete work, and providing immediate rewards. And we're gonna be talking later about how to do that. Let's think about some of the typical things we expect our kids to do. Get up in the morning and keep track of time. Oof. Ensure that their school bag is packed, they've had breakfast, that they're clean and ready to leave for school on time. Being late can look like laziness, but it's not. They're really struggling. At school, students with weak working memory have difficulty remembering routines and recalling what the teacher has instructed them to do, even from 
day-to-day. Uh, -to -day. Um, these mistakes can look intentional, but they're not. A substitute teacher can potentially mean trouble for the ADHD student. Why? The brain of the ADHD child is not flexible, and he or she struggles to adapt to changes in routine. Unexpected changes can lead to total meltdowns. What about problems after school? Homework. Doing homework means using all sorts of those executive skills, and remember the ADHD child has delays in their development. The child with ADHD is not organized, will not remember to write down assignments, and will not remember to bring, the, bring home the needed materials. The child with ADHD will not be able to figure out how long homework assignments will likely take, and will, they will struggle to budget their time. Again, though, some ADHD kids will be stronger in some of these areas, and some will be weaker. Um, I'm going to use this again, Chris. Um, there's a doctor that is, is well known too, and he says, um, if you've seen one ADHD kid, you've seen one ADHD kid. They look different. Um, the child with ADHD will not be able to figure out how long homework assignments are likely to take and will struggle to budget their time. The child with a ADHD will have difficulty breaking down assignments into steps, won't be able to check his work, and uh, won't be able to edit uh, for mistakes and changes. So now there's bedtime to deal with. Remember that the child with ADHD has an inflexible brain so that all transitions from one activity to another will be difficult. Visual reminders for the steps of everyday routines will be essential. The child with ADHD does not automatically know how to wind down and get ready for bed. What about chores? <sighs> Remember your child with ADHD has difficulties with organization, time management, and remembering steps to routine tasks. The child with ADHD will need your help breaking down chores into steps or chunking that information and stepping up a routine to do tasks at certain times. Rewards will be important to make the tasks meaningful and to make them important to the child. You need to help make those tasks stick out and praise for a job well done. Hello, everybody. So we're going to talk about uh, parenting your ADHD child, some, some parenting strategies, and then we'll move into some for some strategies for the classroom as well. So a few key concepts of how to help at home. The struggles that kids with ADHD face are no one's fault, and they are definitely true disabilities. Our children will be successful when they get the chance to practice new skills <clears throat> in real life with our support, teacher support, caregiver support. Kids with ADHD will not respond to natural consequences or praise alone. Um, often children with ADHD will often need a more powerful program than praise to make them do, obey requests, follow rules, and do chores. <clears throat> really important that you make the rewards meaningful. And always look for changes in small steps and gains. And new skills will have to be practiced over and over again. <coughs> Excuse me. Alluding to what... Uh, Glenda said earlier about working memory. A youngster with working memory difficulties can't access what worked or did not work the previous day. So you have to almost always have those visual reminders for them to, for them to, uh, for, to garner success. <clears throat> Some parenting tips. Really focusing on teaching what you would like your child to do or what you would like your child to do more often. For example, teaching your child what to do when he or she first gets home from school. And I, I use that as an example because I think of my daughter. When she comes home from school, the coat goes one place, the shoes go another, the backpack goes another. So basically teaching them in very small steps what you would like them to do when they come home. Solving problems together with your child. <clears throat> Empowering them. Ask them for their input. Make them part of the process. They're more apt to take part. Don't lecture, less talk. Um, I think all of us at Maryville would agree that we found that as, a, as adults and caregivers, we want to solve all of our children's problems, but we found that the more we talk sometimes, the more we increase their frustration tolerance. So being really succinct and clear what we would like them to do. 
And then try not to get in argument mode, being mindful that we are the adults in this situation and as, par as parents and caregivers, we are the teachers. Try to keep your wits about you. I always call it, you don't want to get sucked into the vortex because it's really easy to get sucked into the vortex. <clears throat> Focusing on trying to understand their side. Again, empowering them and making them part of the process. Listen to your child. Use your active listening skills. Ask them for input of what they might think worked for them. Ask your clarifying questions. So what I hear you saying is, so this is difficult because... And keep your focus on the behavior that you would like to see in your household or in the classroom. For example, if your goal is to have your child sit down and do 30 minutes of homework, thinking back to what Glenda alluded to with regards to homework, that can be really difficult for a youngster with ADHD. 30 minutes is an awful long time. Think about changes that might need to take place in order for that to be successful. So a distraction, work-free area within your household. A movement break. I know at Maryville, some of our students, <clears throat> 10 minutes max, that's all they can do. And they'll get up, they'll walk around, they'll do a few errands for us, and they'll come back and complete the task. Using a timer, uh, music with headphones, that's a big one for many of our students. Uh, using a stress ball. <clears throat> and make learning the behavior have value or meaning to your child, as we mentioned earlier. It's got to be meaningful. And changes in the behavior must be tied to positive outcome. It increase, it'll give them an increase in their self-esteem, <clears throat> praise from a parent or teacher, either, at, either at internal or external rewards. So getting to school on time may result in an incentive or reward when they come home. Always the praise piece. We all like to be told we're doing a good job. And as I mentioned earlier, rewarding small steps and gains. Remember, Rome wasn't built in a day. It's an ongoing process. Look for those small gains and be able to, to let them know that they're doing a good job. <clears throat> and it's really important, <coughs> excuse me, really important to give your child more immediate and frequent feedback. The reason for that is some of the tasks that we give them to them would be boring and tedious, and it's going to be really difficult for them to get through. So that immediate feedback, that immediate praise, you're doing a really good job, keep going, keep doing what you're doing, that'll help get them through the process. <clears throat> Planning ahead to prepare your child, student for transitions and changes in routine. Shifting and transitioning is very difficult for some of these youngsters with ADHD. You know your kids better than anybody else. Know their triggers. Know what might set them off. Plan ahead and make, again, again make them part of the process. <clears throat> and discuss with your child about expected behaviors and have them repeat them back to you so you're clear that you guys are both on the same page. <clears throat> One of the big things we use in our classrooms at Maryville are timers because ADHD students <clears throat> um, have difficulty managing themselves relative to time, relative to deadlines, and relative to the, to the future. <clears throat> ADHD means that your child lacks an internal sense of time. Set up a timer, use a stopwatch, have them, have them use their iPhones or their, or their iPods, whatever gadgets that they have. <clears throat> Uh, as an accommodation in school, provide time for longer school assignments. <coughs> Chunk the assignment into smaller steps so a little part is done each day. Sometimes when you give them a big project, at first it's, it may seem monumental that they'll never get it done. Chunk it into small steps. Again, as they chunk, as they complete it, praise and move on. <coughs> so being mindful that uh, youngsters with working memory difficulties, um, sorry, <coughs> They don't have the ability to re retain info or data. They can't remember, they can't always remember rules or steps and they struggle in learning and achievement. So they're unable to learn from past mistakes. And like I said earlier, they can't, sometimes they can't access what worked best, what worked well yesterday and what didn't work well. So children with ADHD struggle to keep in their minds the information they need to complete certain tasks. <clears throat> if you were to walk into one of our classrooms at Maryville, you would see visual schedules visual calendars, visual, visual agendas in the blackboards and on the kids' desks because we find that's really, really effective with our students. And as part of our transition program, we make that part of their transition process. They all have visual steps and visual cue cards um, that list important reminders, steps, and rules. It could indicate staying on task, asking for help, reading all directions. When all steps are completed, go back and check your work. Another example would be <clears throat> for a youngster that is impulsive, when the teacher asks a question in class, they have the, the urge to raise their hand right away, but they're not really sure what they want to say. 
have a, have a step-by-step process on their desk. Do I know the answer to this question already? Can I wait for someone else to, if they're going to find out the answer? Something like that. So have them go through those steps first before they raise their hand. And that, we find, is a real nice piece as they transition because that becomes a real concern as they transition to community school. <clears throat> Uh, be consistent over time. Uh, we find that uh, with ADHD youngsters, um, being explicit, consistent, and predictable lends to success. So be consistent over time, not only at home, but at school and wherever you are. Uh, when you try a strategy, <clears throat> don't give up on it right away. If the first couple days it doesn't work, I know as a parent, give it a, give it a good couple weeks. You gotta give it a try. And ensure both parents use a safe approach. Kids will attempt to divide and conquer. Parents need to maintain a united front. Sometimes we as parents have different parenting styles, but it's imperative for our ADHD youngsters to have two parents or two caregivers who are on the same page. So as I alluded to earlier, <coughs> no one knows your child better than you, so plan ahead. Predict the hard situations for you and your child. So what are their triggers? Is going to the grocery store or going to uncle's house, is that a trigger for them? Knowing ahead of time what may cause a meltdown or anxiety or some confusion. <clears throat> Trust your instincts as a parent and get ready. And develop a plan for what your child is to be doing. Share it and make it brief and clear. Remember, less talk. Okay, for example, um, <clears throat> maybe you're going into a grocery store or you're going into a restaurant. So before you enter the, the store or the restaurant, you kind of go over the rules. What are the rules? You know, stay next to me, don't ask for anything, and do as I say. Okay? If they're able to follow through, they know ahead of time that at the check count counter or on the way home, there's going to be a little incentive or a little reward. Immediate. The logical consequence would be if they cannot follow through, the logical consequence would be they don't get the reward. But they know ahead of time and you've planned ahead for the steps that need, they need to do to be successful. And then follow through and reward. <clears throat> Importantly enough, <clears throat> don't take your child's behaviors personally. I think uh, Glenda Alana alluded to this earlier. If a situation goes poorly, keep in mind you're not a bad parent and your child is not a bad person. This too shall pass. As I mentioned earlier, it is an ongoing process. <clears throat> and as parents, I think we would all agree that we all make mistakes. Most mistakes are minor and most are correctable. <clears throat> we talk about rewards. Uh, ADHD youngsters work best with immediate rewards. Behavior that is rewarded <clears throat> will occur more frequently. So basically, encouraging the behavior that you like will increase the chances of it happening again and again and again. Behavior that is followed by a negative result is likely to decrease. So if there's a lot of nagging, chances are they're not going to want to follow through with that. <clears throat> so what to do to prevent meltdowns? And uh, Glenda alluded to Dr. Barkley once again. According to Dr. Russell Barkley, the main problem in ADHD is being able to apply the brakes, leaky brakes. <clears throat> and for those of you that were at our presentation last month on coping skills, we alluded to leaky brakes somewhat. So if you think in terms of leaky brakes, youngsters with ADHD have trouble with internal control. So if you think of rolling up to a stop sign in your car, your brakes aren't working well. Just like a youngster, he or she knows in a certain type of behavior, they know they're supposed to stop, they just don't know how to stop. So Dr. Barkley talks about some steps to help them self-regulate and self-monitor that. Stopping gives all of us involved time to calm down and think, because if you think in terms of your household or the classroom, if everybody's up here, it's really hard for everybody, anybody to problem solve. Stopping and thinking allows most people excuse me, time to come around and make the right choice. Once a child and parents slash teacher are calm, most strategies discussed are more likely to work. So when we talk about self-regulation, one of the ways we assist, and <clears throat> I'll preface this by saying some of you were here last month for the coping skills, so this may be a, 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 um, a little bit of a reminder, so just bear with me. Uh, we think this is an important piece because we've incorporated the bake sh break shop and or the Beaker Group in our program at Maryville about five, six years ago, and it's been a tremendous, tremendous success in our agency. Uh, it comes from, it was developed by Dr. Duncan McKinley at CPRI in London, Ontario. He himself um, has Tourette's, and it was originally um, <clears throat> uh, made for youngsters with ADHD, but we also found along with youngsters with ADHD, it works with um, um, students with anxiety and depression as well. 
It's a real practical and understandable concept for students and families. So think in terms of a lab beaker. And if you notice, there one out right up there. So if you think in terms of a lab beaker, the more full it gets, <clears throat> the more frustration, anxiety, stress tolerance are in there, eventually leads to meltdown. Our goal is to teach our students and families strategies to self-regulate their anxieties, their stressors, their frustrations, and their emotions. It's basically learn skills in order to put the brakes on when their beaker is becoming full. And it's also <clears throat> CBT based, so cognitive behavioral therapy based, which basically teaches kids that if you can learn to manage your thoughts <clears throat> and you can learn to manage your feelings, then you can change your behavior. And that's something that our, our social workers at Maryville work extensively on with our students. Um, <clears throat> the students and families are taught that everyone has a beaker, adults, students, teachers, parents, grandparents, and everyone's beaker is the same size. And we all react poorly when your beaker is full. So if you think in terms of us as adults, we get up late in the morning, <clears throat> our car won't start, we end up being late for work, we have to stay late for work, our, kid for our, our, our youngster called us, they forgot their lunch at home, they have, we have to bring them a lunch. As the day progresses, our beaker becomes full. So when our beakers are full, things don't go too well. <clears throat> and of course, we teach the students that the real enemy then becomes the full beaker. One of the benefits of this program is um, the students are actively, in the pro uh, actively in the, involved in the process of their own self-regulation. It can be used for all different cognitive levels. It can be used strictly in visual terms, pictures, words, whatever it is that student needs. And it's transferable from classroom to classroom, classroom to home, and home to school. And our students are exposed through it in our classrooms, in their sessions with our social workers. And as we transition them back to community school, we share that language with the community schools. And they've been a, they've been a, a fantastic partner at accepting that. And it's been a real benefit to our students as, as they move on to, turn to community school. <clears throat> so the three things, the last point about the beaker, three things that are learned in a beaker group. So basically, what fills your beaker? We ask the students to identify what causes them stress, anxiety, frustration. We ask them to identify those physical manifestations with regards to how to tell if your beaker's filling. What are the triggers and early warning signs that happen to your body when your beaker's beginning to fill? And if you think in terms of yourselves, when you're getting anxious or frustrated, what happens to us? You know, your face gets red, your you get tense, your fist gets clenched. And then thirdly, the kid's favorite one, how to empty your beaker before it gets too full. So what activities do they like to do when they're stressed, when their anxieties are high? So think in terms of your ADHD youngster doing his or her homework. You can tell their beaker's filling. <clears throat> what can they do at that particular time to kind of lower their anxiety? Step away from the homework a bit. Take a 10, 15 minute break. Do what they do to, to, to self-regulate and then go back to that homework. Okay. <clears throat> and lastly, what can schools do? And I'll, I'll say the quote again. Um, it's from an ADD movie. Uh, I don't know if any of you guys watched the Red Green show, but the actor Patrick McKenna uh, has ADD, and he's kind of the star in it. And once you've seen one AD, once you've seen one student with ADHD, you've seen one student with ADHD. Uh, be informed about AD, ADHD, and some of these <clears throat> strategies that we're going to offer you. Be mindful: what works for one student may not work for another. Okay. <clears throat> Have the child sit in front of the class or somewhere in particular in the classroom where they feel comfortable. Establish good eye contact. And again, for some students with ADHD, that might cause their anxiety to increase. So again, you have to know what works best with that particular student. <clears throat> uh, break down longer directions, not into smaller chucks, but smaller chunks. That's another one of those blips we noticed on Monday night. So chunking information. <clears throat> Uh, check for understanding, and again, empower them. Ask the student for input, as each student is different. Underline keywords, really important, providing visual cues, tools, schedules, reminders. Allow physically hyperactive children out of their seats to hand out and pick up papers, do errands in school, self-directed detours, so if they're a youngster that, you know, Think in terms of a high school student who has a 75 minute period. <clears throat> That's an awful long time again for a, a youngster with ADHD. Maybe midway through that class, they have, a, they have a place to go for a 10 minute break. Sometimes that walk down the hall, get a drink, get some fresh air, come back, does wonders for them to be able to finish that class. <clears throat> Helping the student get organized. Spend a few minutes in the morning 
in a few minutes in the afternoon, ensuring that they have what they need for the morning and the afternoon. Doing some pre-planning again, knowing what are those key times where they may struggle, so ensuring that they have all they need to be successful. <clears throat> ensure the parents and child all know the correct assignment. Communication through an agenda. This came up at our group on Monday night. <clears throat> an agenda is a fantastic thing, but again, if one of the youngsters struggles is either writing in the, aid, in the agenda or even remembering the agenda, if they have an iPhone, iPod with a camera, taking pictures on the board of what their homework is. So when they bring it home, you can show mom and dad what they have for homework. Um, one of the parents, that was one, of, I can't take credit for that. One of the parents, that was one of the parent suggestions on Monday night. It's a fantastic idea, um, using, using technology to our advantage. And they're more tech savvy than we will ever be, at least for me. <clears throat> uh, inform parent and child about typical routines such as quizzes on Fridays, uh, handout written assignments for the week, provide handouts of notes on the written board. One thing that's not up there is just keeping those lines of communication open between the parent and the teacher would be of great benefit to the student. Uh, <clears throat> notifying the family immediately of any late assignments. <clears throat> Allow for expected makeup of late or incorrectly done homework. Uh, use a computer. Interestingly enough, though, our kids who are so tech savvy, so many of our students that tra transition into community school, they're so apprehensive about using a computer because they don't want to stand out and look different. But for many students, using a computer is imperative for them to be successful. Um, writing notes, think in terms of writing notes off a board, up here, down here, and listening to your teacher. That's very difficult to do. So being able to use a computer or even getting notes provided by the teacher so they didn't even have to worry about typing them or, or uh, writing them, having notes provided for them. <clears throat> uh, minimizing deductions for neatness and spelling, giving extra points for, neatness of, for points for neatness. Allow the use of calculators. And one of the things that we did in the classroom that I was in was really successful in the math piece was consider doing every other problem if homework takes too long. Um, if you think in terms of a, a math question, which there might be eight to 10 different questions, as opposed to doing all 10 of them, just have them do every other. And when you propose that to them, they kind of go, oh, that's not a bad deal. I can do that as opposed to all 10. And do the same thing for tests. You know, tests and exams, maybe writing them in an alternative area, a quiet area, so you're not in a classroom of 30, you're in a classroom, or you might be in a room all by yourself or with a few other students where it's a nice, quiet environment and where there are no distractions. So that's the piece on parenting and um, teaching. Jessica's going to come up, and she's going to talk about the medication piece. So thank you for your time. So I'm going to talk a little bit about medications. Um, it seems to be quite of concern for most parents, because when we're thinking about putting our kids on medication, everyone's like, whoa, do we want to put medication to start with and go from there? So we'll go over a few myths. Um, the first myths are about stimulants. So myth one is stimulant drugs only make... Uh, mask the real problem and do not deal with the causes of ADHD. So um, as, they've, as Glenda and Chris have both said, ADHD is a genetic disorder associated with deficits of functioning of certain brain regions connected to inhibition, attention, and self-control. So stimulants work um, to impact the parts of the brain that are underactive and lead to those symptoms of ADHD. Um, even when these effects are temporary um, and your child will not need to keep taking the medication, the drug is still tackling the problem. Um, myth two is stimulants will make your child feel high um, and they're addictive. So studies have indicated um, that there's no connection between taking stimulant medications and abuse of other substances. And actually a recent study from Harvard has indicated that taking stimulants in adolescence means meant a significantly lower likelihood of substance abuse. So what we find um, in some kids, kids who require stimulant, if they're not getting stimulant, they actually will turn to marijuana or street drugs or things like that because they want to self-medicate because they want to feel better. And once you get them on medication, they're able to self-regulate. Um, and for children, it's the complete opposite. Stimulants do not make them feel high. If you don't need to be on a stimulant, of course you're going to get that high feeling, that over energy, tons of energy, can't, can't take, keep your mind you know, from racing until, and then if you have ADHD, when you take it, it slows you down. It calms everything and it does the complete opposite. Myth three, stimulant medication will stunt growth. Um, recent research suggests that the impact on growth is temporary and limited for most children to the first year. 
um, and it's really important that your children follows with their family physician. So there is some research that shows that over the first year of being on stimulant medication, it can actually stunt growth because what we find as a huge side effect of stimulants is at decreased appetite. So kids aren't getting the nutrients to help them grow at the same rate as the other kids. But what research shows is that after about a year, you're, the kids are kind of adjusted to the medicine and they start to get a bit of their appetite back and that growth comes right back. Um, but this is why it's imperative that we see these kids see their family physicians regularly and they're followed up for their growth monitoring and they really keep a track, they keep track of how, um, how much their growth is affected. Um, myth four, stimulants do not lead to uh, lasting academic benefits. Of course, the medications aren't going to improve knowledge, um, but they improve attention and concentration by reducing off-task behavior. They don't make, and they allow their child to be more able to learn. So the medication isn't gonna make your child any smarter. What it's going to allow them to do is allow your child to achieve their fullest potential, um, as it allows them to focus to, better to get more information. So therefore, the medication enhances learning by improving attention, impulse control, fine motor control, and short-term memory. So why is medication often helpful? So there's a few, t there's, when we look at medications, stimulants is what comes first when we talk about um, treatment for ADHD. But if you break down medication for stimulants, there's actually four types of ways to treat ADHD in two separate categories. So there's your stimulants and there's your non-stimulants. People often wonder why there's all these different drugs. There's Concerta, there's Ritalin, there's Vyvanse, there's Dexedrine, there's Adderall, there's all these. Well, though the stimulants are broken into two categories, two types of medication. First one is methylphenidate. Methylphenidate is Ritalin, it's Concerta, it's Bifentin. So these are, the Concerta and Bifentin are your long acting stimulants taken once a day. Um, and Ritalin can be taken up to three times a day. It has a shorter span of only about four hours. So that's one form of stimulant. The other form of stimulant is your amphetamines. So that's your Dexedrine, your Adderall, your Adderall XR, and your Vyvanse. A stimulant still, but works on a different receptor. And then you have your non-stimulant. So people who can't take stimulants or have really bad side effects, we have some non-stimulant options that we can go to, which are your Strateras um, is one way, which takes a lot longer to see effects four to six weeks. Stimulant medication, you will notice with two, within two hours of giving that child medication if it's gonna work for them or not. Um, and the fourth way is a new form of medication that's just been approved here in Canada. It's called Intunov. Um, and it's used a lot in conjunction with a stimulant. Actually, at this point in Windsor, that's how we're using it a lot. Um, and how it works is if you have a dose of Concerta that, say, is working pretty good for your child, but you're just not to the right, but you don't want to up the stimulant, you can add one of these other medications. And they work actually by lowering blood pressure, and it brings a calming effect. By lowering the blood pressure, you're lowering the resistance, which helps to calm them down. So if you're trying to figure out which, how your doctor's going to start this, there's a theory. If you break the population down into thirds, a third of the people are going to respond really well to methamphetamine. A third of the population is going to respond really well to dexedrine, and a third of the population is going to respond really well to both. So if you start your child on Concerta, and they're not seeing the effect that you're looking for, we have to make sure we're at the right dose. So not just the starting dose of 18, we get all the way up to, say, 54 milligrams over a two-week period. And if after about four or five days we're not at the right dose and you're still seeing no side, no change in the behavior, then maybe your child doesn't respond well to methamphetamine try going to the, amph to the amphetamine category. So that would be switch over to Vyvanse. They, you may see a really good response with that. So that's kind of how your doctors work on which medicines they're gonna try. Really to pick which one they start with is probably a doctor's preference. I always use Concerta or I always use Vyvanse. And if that doesn't work, then you go ahead and you switch through. If you don't have success in, with Concerta, chances are you're not gonna have sex, success with Bifentin because it's still the same medication. It's all methylphenidate. You have to switch over to amphetamine to see that bit of response. Um, so stimulants are most commonly used um, and they've shown improvement in behavior and academics and social adjustment in 50 to 95% of children. So that's why they're used quite often. How do stimulant medications work? Stimulant medications increase the breaking power of the brain, the parts of the brain that inhibit behavior and maintain effort and attention. 
Um, scientists believe that the problem in the frontal region of the brain, where the neurotransmitters dopamine and norepinephrine are located, are linked to the ADHD. The stimulant medications increase the action of the brain cells in the frontal region by increasing how much these chemicals are available. So they stimulate and increase the release of the, the neurotransmitters dopamine and nore norepinephrine, and they block or they slow down how much of these chemicals are being absorbed um, back into the neurons. So this allows for the message in the brain to be more effectively transmitted and received. How do medications enhance learning? The stimulant medications improve attention, impulse control, fine motor control, and short-term memory. Um, and the medication doesn't make your child smarter, like I said. It just helps them to show them how smart they really, really are. So what about social skills? Medication can't teach our kids how to communicate or get along with other people, but stimulants do increase your child's ability to pay attention to the requests of others and resist tendencies to react too fast in ways that might be offensive to, other, to others. So by putting your children on stimulants, you're allowing them to receive the, um, the, so, the social cues that people are giving off. They're able to respect and pick up more on social cues than when they're not on the medication. What are the main side effects um, and what, what should we do about them? The biggest side effect with stimulant medication is decreased appetite and insomnia. So as far as decreased appetite and, um, and appetite suppression, it's so common. With little kids that are on them, most stimulants shouldn't be used until the age of six. Um, some kids start at four, depending with which physician you're working with. But we say initially, we don't care what they eat. Throw nutrition out the window. If they want to eat, whatever, just feed them whatever they'll eat at that time. Because when they're really little, we want them to just continue eating. You can worry about getting your nutrition back in. Obviously, we want you to offer them healthy snacks over a whole bunch of sugar-loaded things. But really, if they're not eating, and that's a big side effect, they need caloric intake. So give them what they want. Um, some of the things I've been to talks on that they say, you know, if your child comes home with their lunch and they have dinner with you and they're hungry after dinner, they can have their lunch. Keep their lunch packed and said, this was what your lunch was, this is what you need to eat. It's a good way to keep them using the same, you know, because you've packed a nutritious lunch, it's already prepared for them. Um, increased um, heart rate and blood pressure. Um, Stimulants can actually increase heart rate and blood pressure. Another reason we need to be following with family physician pretty closely so we can monitor to make sure there's no influx in those um, systems. And then insomnia. About half of children on stimulants report difficulty falling asleep. And let your doctor know if this symptom is um, detrimental. So really with the insomnia, this is why stimulants can't be given after 4 p.m. Ritalin, short acting or long acting, your Concerta's Vyvanse by Fenton's can't be given after 10 a.m. because your child will not sleep at night. So if they are, it's 10.30 and they haven't gotten their dose, guess what, they're not getting it today because they are gonna be up all night long. Um, so really, it's really important to keep them on that same schedule of getting them at the same time. So another side effect is ticks. So what are ticks? Ticks are abrupt twitches of small muscle groups around the face. They may be blinking, squinting, or making faces. Ticks can be vocal. Um, withdrawal of medication usually corrects the problem within a week to 10 days. And a family history of a tick disorder or Tourette syndrome will mean that your child should be started on very, very low doses or actually use the non-stimulant forms of medication or the Intunivs and those other medications that are just being, have just been approved. So this is why it's really important that you, you continue to follow with one provider and the doctor knows your family history and knows the child very well when we're starting these types of medications. So some common, other common side effects, again, restlessness, dizziness, appetite suppression, huge, um, headaches, um, and for some, the effects of the stimulant can last too long, causing that insomnia. So if you're finding your child is really just not getting to sleep, talk with the doctor about things that we can do. If it's just, you can't get them to sleep till 11, you know, sometimes they can add melatonin, which is a natural substance to help them sleep. Sometimes they'll say, try giving it to them even earlier, wake them up at six, so it's kind of wearing off by the time. The other thing when we talk about medication, just a piece that Glenda had talked about about homework, we have to remember our medications, they're about eight to 12 hours. And where are they for eight hours of that time once you've given them? They're at school. So once you get them home, a lot of that medication is worn off. That's why homework is even more difficult because really we can't give another long acting stimulant through the night because they won't be sleeping. So it's really important to use those parenting cues and those visual cues to help keep them on track while their medicine is wearing off so they can get a good night's sleep and start the day over again. 
So are you interested in having your tr child try medication? So there's a lot of things we need to ask ourselves when we're really, you know, the doctor saying, you know, I think we have a diagnosis of ADHD. What do you think about starting medicine? So here's a few things that you need to ask yourself. Has the child been assessed medically? Do they have any other medical conditions? Do they have any heart conditions that are undiagnosed or you're not sure? So have they had a physical? How old is your child? They should be older than four. Um, have other treatments been tried? Example, parent training, using your visual cues, all of those things. Um, how extreme is your child's behavior problem? Can you afford the medication? Some medications aren't covered, and if, we don't, if you don't have drug plans, it can get very expensive, so that's sometimes a determining factor whether you can or can't be on specific medications. Are you able to supervise the medication? Unfortunately for us in our city, we have a high abuse rate with Ritalin, Vyvanse, and Concerta. It has great street value, unfortunately, and people are learning about it really quickly. So medication seems to be abused a lot more frequently now. In our city, it's actually very uncommon to get new doctors to be prescribing any Ritalin at all. Everything has gone to long acting because it's much harder to abuse, um, and that seems to have cut down a lot for us. But, you know, if you have small children in the house that are on it and they have older siblings that are in university, that's the newest trend is to take these stimulants that you don't need because you can stay up all night and study. It's huge for university students. Um, what are your beliefs about medication? Um, is there a drug abusing family member in your home? Does the child have a history of psychosis or any thought disorders? Is your child highly anxious, fearful, or apt to complain of bodily symptoms? So sometimes stimulant medication can actually make your child feel a little bit more anxious because they come more in tune with what they're feeling. So even though it slows everything down, they now are almost a little bit hypervigilant for the first little bit because things are just so much more clear in their head. Um, does your physician have time to carefully monitor your child's physical response to the medication? And then how does your child feel about the medication? It's really important to ask your child what they want. Some parents are like, I don't want my kid to be on medicine. I, I really, let's try something else. Let's try non-stimulant. Ask your child. Your child may be sitting there saying, I just want something. I want this music to stop in my head. I want to be able to focus. I want to be able to, I want to try. So ask them their opinion. Again, making them feel empowered. So side effects are Stratera. Stratera is one of those, is a non-stimulant medication. So it does not cause insomnia. It does not seem to make ticks worse in children with tick disorder. It does have a bit of mild appetite suppression and sleepiness in the first few weeks, but that seems to go away really quickly over four weeks, um, where stimulants that appetite suppression can stay for months. Um, and it can also cause an increase in the diastolic blood pressure and, but, and heart rate, but no changes on the EKG. So that's what we, we want to make sure it doesn't widen any QT complexes in the heart and the EKG. And blood pressure, most kids can withstand to have a 10-point increase in their blood pressure because they're very young, their arteries are very um, unclogged, so to speak. And um, so they can, can withstand that bit of change. But that's really one of the little side effects with Stratera. So Adderall is a stimulant, that's the amphetamine family. So Adderall falls into the stimulant category, it contains four different types of amphetamines. Um, it's taken once a day um, or twice a day in five, 10, 20, or 30 milligrams at a time. It works by stimulating the brain's production of norepinephrine and dopamine, the hormones associated with attention and behavior. Um, Adderall not only stimulates the production of these hormones, but it slows the absorption, um, causing an increase in concentration. Concerta, which I would say in our city is one of the most popular medications prescribed for ADHD. It's part of methamphetidate. Um, it's long-acting Ritalin, so to speak. Um, Ritalin is the, was the tell-all, was the starting of all this medication. Concerta is just the long-acting form. So it's a central nervous stimulant. Um, it's designed to be released slowly over time. Therefore, it needs to be only taken once a day. Um, this medication interacts with chemicals in the brain to produce a calming effect for those with ADHD. This has once a day dosing. So Ritalin, which is methylphenidate, is the, and the short acting. Um, sometimes you'll see kids on Concerta and then they'll be on a dose of Ritalin at 4 p.m. If you're really having a hard time when you, when you get home, you can be on that 4 p.m. dosing of Ritalin, even though you have the long acting because it's kind of worn off by that time. So it stimulates the central nervous system. The stimulant works by increasing levels of dopamine in the brain. Um, it was developed back in the 1960s and Ritalin became largely popular in the 1990s when ADD and ADHD began to be understood. 
Um, Ritalin can also be used to treat narcolepsy. And then there's Vyvanse, um, which is an amphetamine. It's probably one of the newer stimulants that we've been using. Um, so like most stimulants, it works by blocking the reuptake of norepinephrine or dopamine in the brain. Um, when ingested, it's broken down into amino acids and amphetamine. This conversion takes place in red blood cells, which increase its length of its effect. And Vyvanse has become increasingly popular for its long-acting effects. So I, what I find in practice is if you try a child on Concerta and you have them on their max dose and it's not working, people are going right over to Vyvanse. Um, and they seem to get a great response because you're switching categories. You've gone from methylphenidate and now you're going to try the amphetamine. And I really have seen a good response with that. Um, and then Stratera is the non-stimulant, um, so it works, it's a specific norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor. It slows down the reabsorption of spe specific neurotransmitter um, back into the brain cells once the chemicals have been released during the activation of the nerve cells. Um, and parents report fewer emotional side effects and behavioral problems on Stratera. And then the other medication, it, it's not on there, is the Intuna, which is the new one, and it's only been... Um, FDA approved in Canada since the end of 2012. So it can, you can give it on its own, but I've, it's really, I've really just been seeing it in conjunction with your concertas or your long actings. And it works to help with the calming. It lowers blood pressure, so it gives that calming effect. And it's normally used as an additive. 